Good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to the Benefits of Botanicals. I'm excited to introduce today Dr. Laszlo Mexler. He is the Medical Director of the Dent Neurologic Institute, as well as a Professor of Neurology and Oncology at the State University of New York at Buffalo. He has published some of the first major, major retrospective research trials on medical cannabis and headaches, as well as other neurological disorders. Um, as I mentioned before, he is the Director of the Cannabis Clinic at Dent, which has more than 15,000 patients certified through their program, a number which continues to grow every day. So um, I think Dr. Mechler has about a 30 minute presentation for you today, which will include opportunities for Q&A. So we encourage you to get involved in the chat. Um, and Dr. Mechler, I will invite you to the, uh, to the stage now. Thank you. All right, well, it's really an honor and a pleasure. And I thank everyone for this invitation. Uh, let me just give you a, a slight background. Um, I come from the academic world. Uh, I'm the chief of uh, neuro-oncology or brain cancer research at Roswell Park Cancer Institute, which is a major cancer hospital in Buffalo, New York, and also the Dent Institute, where we're the largest private neuroscience center in the United States. So I come from a world where I've done a lot of research in, in headaches and migraines and clusters and brain cancer. And and what happened to me is, is I was, I'll be fair with you, I, I was a skeptic in all of this because I was trained in mainstream medicine. And as you all know, only eight or 9% of curriculum in American uni medical universities teach anything about the endocannabinoid system. So physicians are not prepared as I wasn't. But in New York State, we legalized uh, medical marijuana in 2016, January. So I was getting 500 phone calls a day because most of the indications for medical marijuana were actually neurological or oncological, both which is in my wheelhouse. Uh, so we put together a, a, a clinic and we started seeing patients, but I will emphasize the way I run a dent cannabis clinic uh, is completely different than anywhere in the country because I use the term legitimize. I soon realized when I, I was on an executive committee of the American Academy of Neurology, nobody really believed in cannabis because of the lack of sinus, science. So I immediately said, we need to legitimize the whole process. So let me start off by saying my dent cannabis clinic, which sees right now 15,000 patients actively. Uh, I'm not the only one seeing these patients. I have a full team of colleagues seeing patients with nurse practitioners and PAs. And what I've done differently is that most of the certification are neurological disorders. You, you, you know them all, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, pain, neuropathy, spinal cord injury, Huntington's disease. I'm not going to go through that because, it's, because I know in Virginia, the indication for medical marijuana was far more liberal and really based on the physician uh, and the symptoms of the patient. But what I've done at the Institute is I felt that we need to control the patient population. So we don't see patients and just certify them. First of all, I request a form to be filled out by the referring physician. That's step number one. It's on our website. You can go on the Dent Cannabis Clinic. There's a, there's a form there that the primary physician will refer it. Why did I do that? I want a team of physicians to understand what we're doing. So I don't wanna alienate the referring physician. So I had the referring physician refer the patient, fill out the form, and the patient brings it in with them, or it's emailed to our office. The second is, this is controversial. I, I, you know, I've been working here for close to 30 years, and I know the payers uh, and the CEOs, et cetera, and I went to them and said, look, this patient population in general are in chronic pain, and what that means is that usually they're disabled, what, what that means is usually their insurance is not great, and usually uh, they have marginal um, support financially. I can't request money from a patient. I will request money from the insurance company. So what I've done is I build the insurance company. I've never built a patient. So you can figure out the numbers, 15,000 patients, 200 to 250 a pop. I have never built a patient. I only build the insurance company, and many of these individuals have uh, Medicaid and Medicare, because I did not want to cheapen the relationship. Now, this is a personal thing. Uh, I know around the country, it's not done that way. So I, I accept whatever the insurance pays me as a consultation, but let me believe, 
please do believe me, that consultation is a three to four page note, full examination, review of the imaging, the patient's in pain, I wanna know why the patient's in pain. And, 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 and then I send a copy of my dictation or the physician. Every patient fills out on a lap, on a, uh, on a uh, iPad, exactly uh, uh, A, the diagnosis, how long they have it, what drugs they're using, and after I start treating them, uh, side effect profile and also efficacy rates. So we have this iPad of information that downloaded into our data system, which I think is very important. And now the fact that I have 15,000 patients, you can imagine what information I garner at, at a fingertip. So if, for example, uh, just in the next few months, I'll be presenting a, several abstracts at international meetings, specifically the American Academy of Neurology. And then I have very interesting articles on, on Parkinson's, arc, uh, geriatric, trigeminal neurology, and so on based on this data. Now, the problem is, as we all know in the audience, this is a schedule one drug. So for me to do research in the, in the last four years would have been very difficult prospectively uh, because for many reasons, as you all know. So this is in truth, retrospective studies, but the type of retrospective studies that people pay attention to, because when you say, I just did a retrospective study on neuropathy and I had a total of 503 patients, that's not a small number. One of the criticisms of research in cannabis has been small numbers uh, of patients. Well, 503 patients in neuropathy, where, let me just quote you in my, in my abstract, where 85% um, of patients felt that they improved on medical marijuana. Now that's something to listen to, even though it's retrospective uh, studies. Uh, so there is always an issue about placebo and so on. So this is the data, I wanted to share that with you. Now in Virginia, uh, a lot of things are different. And what I proposed is something I felt was important for me and my institute uh, to legitimize the process. Now having, and I, I think we've been very successful. We've, uh, I, I've had the, I've been fortunate to be a consultant to about six different countries around the world, including Mexico and Switzerland and, uh, and England and Hungary. Uh, and I've been very pleased how other countries are looking at what we're doing today. But I will tell you, compared to other countries, we're we definitely many steps ahead of them. So let me just talk about what is medical marijuana. Well, as you know, and you have to know this, uh, which is very interesting, that there's something called the endocannabinoid system, which, which is something that we have internally. And I compare this because there is this term that um, Ethan Russo has made, made called the uh, endo, uh, endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome. When some people, we have a lack of endocannabinoids, which is used to stabilize our homeostasis, meaning we are in an equilibrium. When we're not in that equilibrium, we have decreased amounts of anandamide and 2-AG, which is an endocannabinoid in our system. Uh, not many people know that, and you can compare this to say depression and, and depression, where there's a decrease in, uh, in serotonin and norepinephrine or Alzheimer's where there's a decrease in acetylcholine or uh, Parkinson's where there's a decrease in dopamine. Well, there's some diseases, irritable bowel syndrome, migraines, fibromyalgia, and a whole bunch of other diseases where there's a presumption of low endocannabinoids. Now, the other form of uh, uh, the cannabinoid system is phyto, plant-based. When you talk about plant-based cannabinoids, really there's three types. One is adult use, uh, which is recreational in the past, which is basically uh, uh, has been legalized in now uh, many states. And, and, and there's a second type, which is medical, uh, 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 medical cannabinoids, medical marijuana is what we're talking about today. And the third is hemp-based CBD, which is a uh, hemp-based based on the ruling in 2018, where hemp-based CBD was legalized, and which has a low less than 0.3% THC. It's really a CBD product, which by the way, has medical benefits. Uh, don't let them fool you. The problem with hemp-based CBD, it's non-regulated. The beauty about medical marijuana that it's usually regulated by the state, which is great, but unfortunately, raises the cost of the medical marijuana, which has been an issue. Um, 
a lot of people talk about the entourage effect, which is a synergy. It was really uh, described in 1998 by um, Ben Shabbat and Rafia Mersholem. I really had a recently, uh, uh, I did have a, before the pandemic, I had a opportunity to fly over to California and lecture together with uh, Rafia Mersholem. He's really like the, the grandfather of, of uh, cannabis research and really describes THC in 1964 in Israel and really interesting individual to talk to. But he, they described the entourage effect. And the entourage effect, interestingly, was described in endocannabinoids. And a strong proponent of the entourage effect in, patient, in patients is in, by phytocannabinoids or plant-based is Ethan Rousseau. He's also a, a, a tremendous asset to the cannabis community. But you think about entourage effect as a symphony in which musicians support and harmonize the melody uh, provided by the soloist. Who are the soloists? Well, we all know about THC and we all know about CBD. And for now, that are, that's our soloist. But there is a question, can the other 540 components of the uh, cannabis sativa or indica or ruderalis, could that be could the other smaller components be important when it comes to medical? And the answer is probably yes. But we don't know well enough right now, but the studies have not been done. And I'm optimistic with the ch a new legislation in the uh, House that we may see some changes in rescheduling uh, medical marijuana or uh, for future research possibilities. So, so we have this entourage effect. It's been, it's, it's not, uh, there's a lot of scientists who don't believe in it but there's a lot of people in the business of marijuana who truly believe in it. Basically, the, you get a synergy of not just THC and CBD, but the terpenes, the flavonoids, and other components, including other cannabinoids, CBC, CBG. So the entourage effect may occur. A good example of that, there were studies in cancer pain where they looked at uh, placebo, T this was at GW Pharmaceuticals, by the way, uh, uh, and uh, was placebo, THC, and THC CBD. And for pain control, placebo and THC was about the same. But THC with CBD was better pain control. So the theory about entourage effect, and many people in the business of, of recreational medical believe that the, the plant itself is better than the separate components. Uh, I do believe there's a synergy, but I do believe the science has to be done. And one of the risks of changing it from schedule one to schedule two and the ability to do research is that some of the research may prove something that we have thought was positive, but may not be positive. It really doesn't matter. My job as a, as a, as a professor of neurology and oncology uh, in Western New York is to legitimize the process. We need the science, we need the research, we need that information out to guide. Uh, and, and the advantages of state-run medical marijuana programs is there is supervision because as you all know, uh, uh, non-regulated uh, uh, CBD hemp products as well as uh, adult um, marijuana is associated with a significant amount of con contamination from bacteria, fungi, heavy metals, pesticides, as well as insects. So we have to clean up our act. I apologize for using that term because the cannabis plant is a filtering system for every garbage that's thrown into the ground. It's wonderful for that. In fact, cannabis in, after Chernobyl was used to clean up the ground around the nuclear waste because that's what the plant does. Uh, so, so that is very important that we understand that uh, the science is going to drive. And one of the problems I have uh, in my position at the national uh, societies is that even though there has been over 60 medical societies say that we should switch from Schedule 1 to Schedule 2, and for a reminder, Schedule 1 is, a, is something that happened uh, uh, in the 1970s via uh, President Nixon, and basically Schedule 1 drugs are heroin, ecstasy, peyote, uh, and these drugs, no medical help, but severely addictive, none of which should be ma uh, medical marijuana. Uh, so, so this is a important distinction. 
uh, I do feel that um, medical marijuana unequivocally because I has changed the lives of my patients. So I started my journey by saying I was a skeptic. I did it because I had no choice in New York State. We we're the largest neurological center. And, and um, at the end of the day, uh, I've become an advocate. I truly believe that there is strong medical benefits uh, with uh, medical marijuana. My only fear is that as recreational mar marijuana becomes popularized, and, and I think close to 68% of Americans feel it should be, um, uh, it will minimize and destroy the medical marijuana program. And that, there's examples of that in other states, because at the end of the day, over 90% of people, when they had a choice between recreational and medical, have chosen recreational. But I will emphasize, because I've traveled in every, you know, all the states, Colorado and California, looking at, uh, uh, looking at medical marijuana centers, every time I see a butt tender, the thing they tell me uh, is, well, patients just want to get high. Let me emphasize to you, patients don't want to get high. My patients don't. There is a subset of the population, probably significant, probably younger, uh, to do want to get buzzed and high. Uh, but most patients in medical marijuana want improved quality of life. I remember when I, my youngest patient is six months old, my oldest patient is 102 years old. And I recently published an article, and you can look up my name in, under geriatric, where we had over 200 and some patients over the age of 75 to 102 who used medical marijuana, and the improvement rate was over 80% of patients improved the quality. So in all the studies I've done, and again, there's a, there's a publication trail, uh, I will tell you my take home message. Patients are a matter of the story. There's always gonna be a 15 to 20% of patients who say, nah, I don't feel it. That's okay. Because if you look at research I've done with other medications, uh, I tell you for sure that uh, other medications that have been proved, approved by the FDA, 40 to 50% of patients don't get benefit. So when I see a cannabis patient and they put their arms around me and tell me I changed their quality of life, uh, you as a physician uh, feel A, proud, and two, know there's something there that needs to be fine-tuned and researched. So I do believe medical marijuana has improved the quality of life for my patients. And most important, as I look at the statistics, what percent of my patients on medical marijuana become euphoric, get high, it's less than 3% in the age of over 75 and probably less than 2% in the rest of the age groups. So no, my patients are not getting buzzed and that's why they're better. They're not getting high. They're getting better because uh, medical marijuana, depending on the ratio, depending on the dosage, depending on the pharmacokinetics and how you give it, uh, improves uh, anxiety, sleep, anti-inflammatory and pain. Now, if I had a drug that did all four things without the side effects of an Ambien, without the side effect of a Valium, without the side effect of the hydrocodone, and without the side effect of ibuprofen, that would be the world to the medical societies and show and proof. So the medical societies could embrace, because one mistake I think is to alienate the medical community. And one way to alienate the medical community is not giving them enough science to show that this actually works. Uh, I know it works. I'm an I'm a advocate. I'm a true believer. Uh, and I, I believe that there is medical uh, efficacy uh, depending on the ratios, depending on the dosage, and depending on how you get it. Um, Recreational marijuana is out of my um, wheelhouse. I'm uncomfortable with that only because of several reasons. Recreational marijuana tends to be smoked. I'm a cancer doctor, so don't ask me to, to approve people smoking all the time. I've been fighting 30 years for my patients to quit smoking. So I can't add smoking regularly and, and for long periods of time. But I will say one thing about recreational marijuana. Uh, and I, I've thought about this a lot. Um, um, for you know, Not that you're interested, but I don't smoke and I don't drink at all, period. Uh, so obviously I don't do marijuana. So, uh, 
Uh, I'm, uh, so why am I in this field? I'm in this field because I'm helping my patient population. For 30 years, I've been asked by every brain tumor patient I've treated. And I treat about 10 patients every day. And, and they asked me for medical marijuana. And for about 25 years, I said no. In the last four or five years, I said yes. And I recently handed in an abstract that will be done in the next few months. And it's about uh, the, the use of cannabis and glioblastoma multiformin. So it's important to understand that their quality of life have dramatically improved. It's not that I'm treating the cancer, although there's some scientific proof that there is uh, some cancer benefit, a basic science proof. What I'm doing is just improving their quality of lives. So I'm very happy uh, to say that uh, I'm trying to change how medical societies look at medical marijuana by legitimizing the process. What I'm doing in New York State does not have to be replicated in Virginia. I'm giving you what I'm doing so you understand my perspective. Um, I'm very pleased that Virginia has taken the steps forward uh, and, and, and legalized uh, um, um, medical marijuana. One thing, and I think this is important. I realized after I'm seeing, yeah, you can imagine 15,000 patients, right? That's a lot. Um, but I realized that a lot of people never came back to me. So I, I started doing my research, and it's a population study. And I presented this in California. And it's a population study is why did patients not come back? Is it been work or is it because the price? And it always turns out to be the price. So then I looked at racial disc, uh, discrepancies between individuals who came, who came back. So I looked at 614 randomly selected patients about 276 African-Americans, 431 Caucasians. Uh, and I noticed that, 80, uh, that uh, of those failing to return, those ones that did not return, 80% of African-Americans and 42% of Caucasians cited the cost. So we have a, a New York State program which has trying to, trying to level the playing field for what has happened in 30 years about the discrimination toward the African-American uh, population with, with, uh, because of its federally legal and because of what's happened in the community. And then we brought into the medical marijuana and lo and behold, my studies have shown what that population that we should be helping the most is the group that cannot afford it. So whatever you do in Virginia, remind yourself that this is, we're taking care of human beings. So we have to offer them the opportunity to obtain this, the product so you can improve their quality of life and not have the same problem I am having in New York State that you just can't, African-American population can't afford it and don't come back. So that, that's an abstract that I, that I presented last year. And, and, and I'm, I was very surprised that nobody even picked up on it because it's a very informative numbers of the differentiation between the two populations, uh, how we've continued, probably not on purpose, but uh, the, the, the uh, prejudices that we still have within our medical society, which is being evaluated at multiple fronts. So uh, at this point, I think I, I'm, I'm being told that I better sh shut up. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at a few questions. So, um, so the question, I was told by a radiologist to seek esoteric medicine for my ATR, where should I start? Um, well, I think right now, if you have Virginia, medical marijuana is a good start. I don't see the disorder that you may have there, um, what's an illness, so I can't comment on the illness. We just published a case that will be published in about a month from now on the use of medical marijuana in autism and the uh, use of medical marijuana in migraine. Um, so I'm gonna, uh, they don't come back because they don't give them actually they want. It's not just, so they don't come back because they don't give them actually what they want. So, and the, and the reason they don't come back is not because, so I, I looked at that and see, I called each patient, my staff did, my research team. And the reason they said that they did not come back was specifically the cost. You know, in Western New York, I have people paying 500 to $1,000 a month for medical marijuana. 
uh, I, I, not many people can afford that. Anybody, independent on race. So I don't think it's a racial issue, per, by the way. I don't think it's a color of your skin. I think it's a, a issue about finances. So we looked at the average zip code salaries of these individuals, and there were half that of the group uh, of the of the Caucasian. So if you're white and in the same zip code, uh, uh, we looked at Buffalo and all every county in Western New York, and we evaluated by uh, the average uh, 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 average pay those zip codes, and that's how we came to the fact that we think it is financial. And and I still have patients every day. I mean. We see uh, 80 patients every day. So you have to imagine that I asked that question. So a lot of these patients, I switched over to uh, hemp based CBD, which is far cheaper. And hemp based CBD has productivity. So again, I haven't talked about ratios. I haven't talked about tinctures or capsules or vapes uh, and kinetics of that. That's for a different discussion, but we take all that in consideration. What I don't want is that patients come to me, I, I spend four minutes with them, I sign something, they go to a dispensary, and somebody at the dispensary makes a decision on what, how they should treat it and what to, I don't do that. I give a strong recommendation ratio, dosage, and how to titrate over the next one month, and I see them back in two to three months. I don't let them go for a year, okay? This is how I practice. So this is, you know, it's gonna be practiced differently elsewhere. Um, okay. Have you looked into recreational edibles? I have not because in New York State, recreational is not legal. Um, okay, so, so uh, I mean, there is, if you look at Colorado statistics, you'll see that a lot of people with chronic pain are between the age of 18 and 30 and are white males with other forms of substance abuse. So there's a danger. That's, again, that's uh, a recreational marijuana. That was the question I was asked. So you have to look at your population. People who come to me do not want to get high. Why? Recreational is far cheaper than medical. So why would they come in medical? And don't forget, we have a I, um, uh, I stop here in New York State, which means they I know exactly when they pick it up, how much they pick up and how much they use. So if they want a medical marijuana card in New York State, I will know if they're using it or they just want the card. So if they pulled over, then they can show the police officer the card. So, so remember that uh, New York State is rather rigid. And in many ways, in my perspective, that's good because it gives me more control, more knowledge, and, and then I can patients. But I don't see patients trying to trick me that often. So let me see. One more minute. Okay. Uh, why is Virginia is getting certification out of reach so when they's on Medicaid? I can't answer that. Uh, what's this? No appetite. So, so the only thing that I'm outside my wheelhouse when it comes to uh, certification is uh, uh, ear inflammatory bowel disease. But a lot of my patients with fibromyalgia and migraines have irritable bowel disorder or Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. And I will tell you that medical marijuana unequivocally shows great benefits in patients with GI disease. Uh, and, you know, I, I ask them, so how's your headaches? And they go, my headaches are better, but you know what? My bowel movements are great now. So again, I can't tell you uh, how this has affected the quality of life of patients who have given up. Um, the questions I ask them, do you use recreational marijuana? I ask them upfront. You know, nowadays nobody denies it. Uh, and, and the reason I tell them that I like them to switch over from recreation and medical, and most of them agree. Uh, I also ask them if they have a strong personal family history of schizophrenia. Uh, not that I won't give medical marijuana because I will, I just will lower the THC and elevate the CBD. CBD products do help uh, patients with uh, psychosis as studies have been ongoing. Um, I'm looking, it's not news that cost is the chief reason for forgoing many means and methods of healthcare. So I think this is, a, this is very important. For, for us to accept medical marijuana or any form of marijuana that's controlled by physicians and pharmacists or 
is to have it accepted by medical societies, number one, number two, physicians in the community. And that is changing as you all understand. Because at the end of the day, who's gonna pay for this? Insurance companies will not pay for it because there's no scientific proof. Anecdotal, testimonials, not enough. Insurance companies won't pay for it. But I promise you one thing, when an insurance company sees the foresight to pay for medical marijuana, that will save a ton of money on the other drugs. My studies here, which I have here, show that some patients throw away five drugs. They throw away their benzodiazepines and have statistics for that. The opioids decrease from 30 to 50%. So they will save money on patient treatment if they approve cannabis. We have to show that them. Once we have insurance payer approval, then the ball stops going and our patient population will be able to afford it. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Dr. Meckler. Really appreciate um, you sharing the information with us here today. Um, is there a good way to, for folks to get in touch with you or your organization if they have additional questions? Yes, uh, you can look at my uh, lmechler at deninstitute.com or just, excuse me, just deninstitute.com. And then you send it there and, and we'll be happy to answer your questions, okay? Or, you know, better yet, I'm gonna put it up on the chat right now and then you'll have it. And then you can send me a uh, text uh, or, uh, through the uh, emails and I'll be happy to answer to my best of my ability. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. And thanks everyone for being here. Um, we're gonna jump to our final session of the day um, here at 1 p.m. on equitable legalization. So we'll hope to see you all there. And uh, thank you again, doctor. My pleasure. Thank you for the invitation.